Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Rodriguez, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. Thanks so much for joining us today for the first of several sessions uh, introducing our uh, Mission to Mars Student Challenge. We've got some great speakers today. We've got a, a bunch of really cool questions coming in online. Um, so we're really excited to spend this hour with you um, going through what is a really, really uh, awesome opportunity. This is this is the time that uh, finally our Perseverance rover is landing. And as we get ready for uh, what's called EDL, Entry, Descent, and Landing, um, we want to kind of recap everything that's gone so far. So what has uh, a launch up to this point uh, uh, entailed? How did we get there? How have we spent uh, our, our past seven months as we traveled through space and landed at Mars, um, and a little bit of uh, what we can expect next. So um, I, I hope you're as excited as I am. I, it's been really cool to uh, kind of reconnect with people, especially with everything that's going on right now. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to uh, get excited about anything after a pretty gruesome 2020, um, but really, really amazing to talk to educators all over the country as we, we prepare for this thing that kind of unifies us, that uh, um, all of us, you know, whether you're a, a teacher or just a general science nerd can really enjoy. Um, in fact, even just earlier today, I, I uh, was contacted by an old friend of mine from high school uh, and I've got this email from Angie and, and she's an educator now. We got to talk a little bit about this session. So hopefully she's watching. Um, just really, really neat to be able to uh, work with teachers and, and uh, kind of get them started as we can get kids really pumped about this experience. Um, to do so, I, I thought we could kind of walk through the challenge a little bit. So if I could show you guys a few slides, um, the first of which uh, you can see my my very handsome buddy here, Lyle Tavernier, who's uh, going to be running through a little bit of like a weekly uh, uh, stage setting. So each of the five weeks uh, before uh, uh, the Perseverance rover lands, um, he'll prep us with a little conversation about what challenge you can look forward to next? What part of the mission should we explore a little further? And he'll be joined, uh, just like we are today, by some awesome subject matter experts out of JPO. Um, on the second slide, you'll see uh, we've already started collecting some of your student work. So many really, really great examples, some incredible teachers. Um, so in our first week, we really want to look at, uh, you know, understanding Mars better. Why is it that we're going there? And what can we expect? And you can kind of see some, some cool student uh, uh, submissions on how they're exploring the red planet. Uh, in the week after that, on slide three, you'll see we have to plan our mission. And it's not like when you know we want to go to Mars, we just hop in the lab and just say, let's go, right? What, what does that entail? What are we going to build? How are we going to build it? What is it going to do? So we'll have some lessons looking at the design of a mission so that you can be successful. On slide four, you'll see uh, once we get there, we wanna be able to, to drive around and do awesome things. Uh, so that can be like uh, roving around um, and uh, uh, kind of exploring the Martian surface. But before that, uh, we want to be able to launch properly, right? So uh, uh, launching out to Mars uh, on slide five, you'll see uh, the, the, one of my favorite videos, which is uh, uh, launching stomp rockets, uh, these little paper rockets. I love that the kid uh, got so excited that she she actually missed the <laughs> the launch. Um, but you know, so we we've got to be able to get there. And of course, on slide six, uh, you'll see the key issue for us now is landing. So how are we going to actually make sure that we land safely once we arrive? Um, and you can see here some really really great work as kids touch down safely, kind of like a modification of the egg drop challenge. On slide seven, you'll see um, that in addition to these great resources that we'll, we'll talk about online, and I'll highlight some of the web websites at the end, um, a lot of opportunities for teachers as well. So we'll have a teachers only workshop on February 6th, where you can come and join us and we'll look at some of these activities um, and not, not just for science classes. How, how could you do this in your arts class, in your language arts class? Um, how can you bring kind of, you know, the excitement of this event to, to any curriculum? On slide eight, you'll see uh, that 
beyond classroom activities, there's tons and tons for us to do. So even if you're not an educator, but you want to read a little bit about Mars, you want to understand how we got to this point, uh, some really exciting articles written for you, written for the general public on how it is that we've, we've come to this point. And lastly, uh, I'll say on slide nine that uh, uh, if you haven't signed up for the Mission to Mars Student Challenge, please do so. Uh, you'll see the website uh, here and tons of, of, of just opportunities by grade level aligned to next generation science standards if you're a classroom teacher. So you can kind of follow along week by week what events are happening, whether it's here on a live stream, whether it's one of these videos with, uh, with Lyle, um, tons and tons coming out of our office for you guys to be able to, to really be engaged with every step. So with that, um, uh, I hope you guys are excited. As mentioned, as you can tell, I'm very excited. And to, to kick us off, what better way than to be joined by uh, our awesome speaker today. So Swati Mohan uh, is a, uh, a guidance engineer and has been a, a, a uh, is clearly an expert on uh, EDL, that entry, descent, and landing. So I'm going to turn it over to her for uh, a little bit of a, a breakdown on why we are going, why we selected the places that we're, we're going to land, and really the incredible technology that it takes to do this. So please, Swati, take it away. Thank you, Brandon. Um, if we can bring up my slides on uh, slide two, I'll first give an overview of why we're going to Mars and then a description of the Perseverance rover. So on slide two, uh, Perseverance is not the first mission to go to Mars. It's not even the first rover to go to Mars. Our recent campaign of scientific exploration on Mars really started in the late 90s. And it was driven by trying to understand whether or not there was water on Mars. And the reason we have this phrase of follow the water is because wherever we find life on Earth, we usually find water with it. So the thought was, if we can find water on Mars, then the chance of finding life there is all that much higher. So we actually sent the first rover to Mars, um, which was the Sojourner rover in 1990, 697 timeframe. And since then, we've sent rovers, we've sent orbiters, all of them trying to find this water. The most recent rover to go to Mars, a Curiosity rover back in 2011, actually did find signs of water currently on Mars. So that discovery really fed into how our exploration changed of Mars. So now that we had find, found the water, what were we going to do next? So the next phase of this exploration was really to see if there were signs of life on Mars. Not little green men who are walking around there now, but signs that Mars was actually a habitable place in the past and that there could have been life there in the past. So the current Perseverance rover that's on its way to Mars will use its scientific equipment to search for the signs of past life on Mars and really explore whether Mars was a habitable place in the past. The added goal for Perseverance is that it is the first leg of Mars sample return. So not only is it going to do the in situ robotic exploration once it's on Mars, but it's actually going to collect samples and save them for another mission to come, grab those samples and bring them back to Earth. So if we can go to slide three, Here's what I like to think of as a family portrait of the rovers on Mars. We have the great grandfather or great grand rover, which was Sojourner um, rover. It was about the size of a, a microwave. And then we have the twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, which were about the size of a little car. And then the last rover, which is the parent to the Perseverance rover, which was Curiosity, which landed back in 2012. Now, all of these rovers have helped shape our understanding of how to do robotic exploration on the surface of Mars. And we've been able to build from the lessons that we've learned from each of these rovers all the way to the Perseverance rover that we have on its way to Mars right now. So going into a little bit of how entry, descent, and landing worked in previous Mars missions to give you an idea of what's new for Perseverance. If we go to slide four, 
This diagram actually shows you how the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, conducted their entry, descent, and landing. So basically, because Spirit and Opportunity were decently small, the main entry, descent, and landing system was to cover them with a bunch of balloons so that once you released them from the parachute, they had this nice cushy uh, sphere around it and they would just bounce on the surface, um, protected inside these balloons until they came to a nice gentle uh, stop on the surface and then the balloons would deflate and it would allow the rovers to just kind of drive off. Now, the reason this worked for Spirit and Opportunity was that they were smaller so that the force of hitting uh, the ground as you bounced in these balloons wouldn't tear the balloon. And also it was a generally flat area. Now we tried to use the same technique when we developed the Curiosity rover, uh, but that didn't quite work. Curiosity was so much bigger that we had to design a new way of doing entry, descent, and landing. And the new method of using entry guidance and the infamous sky crane maneuver, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is the same basic structure that we're using for the Perseverance entry, descent, and landing system. So Perseverance in its journey to Mars, if we go to slide five, it's really searching for the signs of life. It is targeting Jezero Crater, which you see on this image right here. The white circle is the rough area where we expect Perseverance to land. And you can see that there's kind of uh, cool features in this area. So the, there's, for example, a little bit of a cliff right in the middle of that white circle. And you see these features that look like a fan kind of coming out and uh, entering into that white circle. This is, Jezero Crater is actually thought to be an ancient riverbed. So it was chosen for the great scientific value that it has and the different types of geological features in that small area. Now, the same reason that scientists really like Jezero Crater is the same reason why we engineers don't like Jezero Crater because there are cliffs and rocks and slopes. And while the geologists really love those because it tells us so much about the surface, the engineers don't really like them because you have to land on them and they could pose potential hazards to the rover. But Perseverance has a new technology on it that actually made it possible for us to send Perseverance to Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater was actually considered for the Curiosity rover, but was deemed to be too hazardous and that we didn't think that Curiosity would land with a high enough probability of success to land safely at Jezero. But this new technology called Terrain Relative Navigation actually allows us to go to Jezero Crater and land safely. And I'll get into terrain relative navigation in a little bit. So to give you a little bit of context of where we are in the mission and how the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission kind of lays out, if we go to slide six, the Perseverance mission is kind of broken up into four big chunks. So first we have launch. Perseverance launched from Cape Canaveral in July of 2020, beautiful launch. After that, it has to get itself from Earth to Mars. This is about a six-month cruise from Earth to Mars, and this opportunity only comes once every roughly two years. So there were about three to four weeks or so in the summer of 2020 where we could target to actually get to Mars, and this opportunity was really important that we launch within that window in order to make sure we could get all the way from Earth to Mars in the most efficient manner possible. So this next phase, cruise and approach, that's where Perseverance is right now. We are currently about 35 days out from landing and uh, we're pretty close to, to Mars right now. During this six months, uh, we do all sorts of checkouts, make sure Perseverance is safe and stable and uh, continues to talk to the ground, basically getting ready for entry, descent, and landing. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as the seven minutes of terror, because it takes seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere down to the ground, and it's completely autonomous. We have no control from the ground of being able to joystick 
the entry, descent, and landing system. At the time of entry, descent, and landing, Perseverance uh, is really close to Mars, and Earth and Mars are actually separated by uh, about 127 million miles. If you think of that in terms of how fast it takes light to travel, that's 11 minutes one way for light to travel from Earth to Mars. And given that that's how we send signals, it would take 11 minutes for, as soon as Perseverance tried to say something, for us to hear it on the ground. And it only takes seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface. So there's no way that we would be able to hear in time to affect any change during entry, descent, and landing. So the whole sequence of entry, descent, and landing happens completely autonomously without the ground operators in mission control actually doing uh, any joysticking of Perseverance or any commanding. And then once we're safely on the ground, Perseverance can actually do its surface mission. We are planning for about one and a half Mars years, which is roughly about three Earth years of roving around and doing science and all the cool stuff that we design Perseverance. So if we go to slide seven, these are one of my favorite family photos. This is a picture of the entire Mars 2020 uh, vehicle all wrapped up uh, just before it was about to launch from Cape Canaveral. So uh, on, the, on one side there, you see the actual picture of the hardware. And on the other side, you see a kind of segmented view that lets you see the individual pieces. Now, even though the only thing that lands on the surface is a Perseverance rover, there's a lot of hardware that's needed to actually help it get from Earth to Mars. So we start from the uh, cylindrical item on the top. This is the crew stage. So the crew stage has sensors and actuators and thrusters that um, keep the vehicle spinning through the entire six months cruise from Earth to Mars. Once we reach uh, about 10 minutes out from entry into Mars, we will actually cut the cruise stage and it goes and crashes somewhere on the other side of the planet. And then all that's left is what we call the entry capsule. This has the back shell, which is a kind of cone on the top. And then it's on the bottom, it has the heat shield. Now the heat shield is what protects the Perseverance rover as it enters the Martian atmosphere, because it can heat up super, super hot. And if we didn't protect it somehow, it would basically just melt. In the back shell is where we have the parachute. Once we get through the entry atmosphere, we'll actually deploy the parachute and slow down the capsule. At this point, the heat shield comes off and then inside is what we call the power descent vehicle. Now you can see a kind of claw-like system on the right-hand side. These are our landing engines and we tuck Perseverance up underneath it. It kind of has its wheels all folded in into that um, power descent vehicle and that will fly after we get rid of the parachute because the parachute can't slow us down all the way. It'll fly the vehicle, fly Perseverance to the spot where it's gonna land and then gently lower Perseverance on a set of ropes until Perseverance is deploys its wheel and lands wheels down on the surface. And then we cut the power descent vehicle and it goes and flies and crashes off. So all this hardware that you see, only the rover actually stays on the surface successfully. Everything else gets cut and crash and eventually will be in other places on Mars um, used solely to get Perseverance safely to the surface. Uh, if you go to slide eight, this gives you a little bit of context. So when you see a person next to this hardware, it looks really big, but launching it actually requires a lot of force. This is a picture of the whole Mars 2020 spacecraft all buttoned up uh, when they were about to close the launch vehicle fairing. So at the bottom, you see everything that I showed you in the picture before, it's kind of all kind of capitalized in the bottom in this huge fairing that uh, is just the top half of the launch vehicle. And then this part goes on top of the actual uh, launch vehicle to stand in um, on the launch pad to launch. So if we go to slide nine, this is a beautiful launch of the Perseverance rover on in July of 2020. Um, it was no small feat to get us here given the uh, pandemic, um, but 
we managed to pull through, get everything buttoned up, even with all the restrictions that we had to do with the pandemic and all the uh, unknown unknowns that get uh, thrown at us. We even actually had an earthquake about uh, 20 minutes from when the, the rocket was going to take off. That was super crazy, um, but just shows you how fitting the name is of being able to persevere through all that and go for a crystal smooth launch. So on slide 10, this kind of gives you a graphical picture of how Perseverance gets from Earth to Mars. Um, at the bottom circle there, that's where, per, that's where Earth was at the time of Perseverance's launch. Now, Earth and Mars are always moving. So we time it such that as Perseverance goes um, from Earth's rough orbit to Mars's orbit, Mars kind of catches up to Perseverance. So it makes this kind of C-shaped trajectory in the uh, ecliptic plane. So the top part of where Mars is, that's kind of where Mars will be on landing day and Earth has kind of come around. So we have, we have that distance. Uh, on slide 11, we have a cool video to show you of what the entry, descent, and landing uh, will look like. So if we can roll the video. Okay, so Entry, descent, and landing will be on February 18th, 2021. We are five weeks from entry, descent, and landing. Actually, from today, entry EDL is on a Thursday at about uh, 12.30 to 12.50 in uh, Pacific time. So as we're approaching Mars, we do our final checkouts. We make sure that the spacecraft is oriented as it needs to be. Uh, the first thing that happens is we separate the crew stage. You can see it kind of flying off to the side there. And then the vehicle will actually turn to the orientation needs for entry. Once we enter the atmosphere, Perseverance actually does what we call a guided entry. So it flies itself through the atmosphere with a series of S maneuvers so that it can actually control its distance to the target. Uh, during this time, we have so much heat that it's being built up. The, the vehicle is really going through it. Um, but the heat shield protects us from that. As uh, Perseverance slows down while it's in the atmosphere, it's really controlling its range to the target so we can pick the right time and the right velocity at which to deploy our parachute. The parachute gets us much slower in the atmosphere. We release at about Mach 1.75 and eventually um, get down to about 80 to 110 meters per second while we're on the chute. Once we're on the chute, we'll um, deploy the heat shield. This will be the rover's first look at the ground where we'll actually be able to see it with our radar and see it with our cameras. Um, at this time, we'll perform the terrain relative navigation to pick our safe landing spot and then execute this divert maneuver to get out from underneath the parachute and fly over to the safe spot that we've chosen. Once we're above that safe spot, we'll start flying straight down vertically and controlling our descent to get as smooth and slow as we can while the radar still sees the ground. At a certain altitude, um, we will actually start deploying the rover on these bridles while the descent stage is still hovering. The rover will go down, and as soon as we sense that it touches the surface, the descent stage will cut its uh, bridles and fly away, because otherwise, we don't want it to come back down and crash onto the rover. So after that, uh, that seven minutes from the top of the atmosphere when we enter to the bottom of uh, entry, descent, landing when the, the rover is safely on the ground, um, you know, we're wheels down. And at that point, Perseverance is ready to conduct its surface science mission. So here's a pic on slide 12 is a pictorial diagram of what entry, descent, and landing looks like. And it kind of has the times here of what I narrated in that video. So it starts at about entry minus 10 minutes, where we separate the crew stage. Um, we separate a few uh, balance masses. The balance masses had kept it balanced during cruise, but in order to fly like a plane, we need a lift vector. So we separate the balance masses and it creates a center of gravity offset, which actually allows the entry capsule to fly like a plane. And we use the entry phase to guide it um, to the target. Um, once we're finished with the entry guidance phase, we'll actually deploy the parachute um, 
and then release the heat shield, get our first look at the ground, determine where we are, both from the radar and from the new technology terrain relative navigation, which will actually use camera images to look at the ground, compare it to map, and figure out where exactly we are. After we figure out where we are, we use a map that we store on board of all the safe spots to land in and find the safest spot that's closest to where we can get to and aim for that spot. Uh, and we do this using the divert maneuver. So the parachute can only get us so slow, it can't get us slow enough that we can actually land. So we cut the parachute um, at about two kilometers altitude and then come down on the engines in order to slow us down even more and then use that to fly to the safe spot and then get a nice safe touchdown by rowing, lowering the rover uh, on bridles sensing when it touches down, and then cutting the descent stay so it goes off and flies. Um, on this slide here actually has the four key new technologies that Perseverance has, but uh, the Curiosity rover didn't have. So the Medley 2 is, an, is a set of instruments that allow us to measure um, different aspects like uh, temperature and uh, sen pressure sensors during entry to give us more information about entry, descent, and landing. It's an upgraded suite from what Curiosity had. Um, Perseverance will also have a lot more cameras than Curiosity did facing in all sorts of directions so we can really see what's going on once we get those back down to the ground a few days after landing. And then two key technologies. Uh, the first is range trigger. This changes the way we deploy the parachute based on where we are with respect to the target. Um, this actually gives Perseverance a more accurate uh, landing zone than Curiosity has because it's able to deploy and uh, basically get a more accurate spread of where to land compared to Curiosity. And the final one is terrain relative navigation. Terrain relative navigation really is the first mission that has landed with its eyes open on Mars. All the previous missions have used radar, which is kind of like closing your eyes and using your hands to feel how far you are from the ground. But first, Perseverance will actually see where the ground is using a camera and be able to compare what it sees to a map that it has of the Jezero landing site area to figure out where exactly it is. And then this information is um, conveyed to uh, another algorithm that looks at all the safe spots of that we've mapped out um, of the Jezero land, crater landing site and picks the one that's closest and safest so that we can go there. And this feature is really what lets us go to Jezero crater because the same things that I told you before of what the scientists love, of the, the cliffs and the rocks and slopes, all of that is great for the, the scientists, but those are not very safe for the, for the rover. If you happen to land right on a rock, you might tip over. This is like if you were to skydive out of a parachute, you want to make sure that you don't land on your feet right on top of a rock because you might twist your ankle or, or things like that. The same way that you would consider those things if you were skydiving, we want to consider those same things for the Perseverance rover. You want to make sure you don't land on the slope because if you're going really fast when you land, you might slide right down. So being able to know where you are with respect to the ground and know where the safe spots are allows you to land in the safe spots in between all of these different uh, hazards like the rocks or the slopes. So you can kind of thread the needle and land in between them so you don't have to drive super far to get to them. You're kind of right in the middle and ready to go once you land. If we go to slide 13, this kind of gives you a pictorial diagram of what the terrain relative navigation system does. So on the uh, on one half, you see those green circles. This is the area where we um, can potentially land. And before terrain relative navigation, you could kind of land anywhere in that area, including the red spots, which are not very safe. But with terrain relative navigation, uh, you're able to divert away from those red spots and only land in the regions that are safe. And this increases the probability of landing safely from about 80 to 85 percent of what we would have had without TRN to over 99 percent safe. 
And the way that terrain relative navigation works is two parts. First, we have a lander vision system, system, which is the camera that takes the images and then compares them to the map to figure out where we are. And then the second part, once we know where we are, we use that information to select a safe landing target based on our knowledge of uh, where we are and where we can get to with the fuel that we have remaining. So that kind of gives you an overview of perseverance and entry, descent, and landing. Now, uh, going to Mars is never easy. I think all the total Mars missions that the world has ever sent is only about a 50% success rate. And it really goes to show you how important it is to be humble in doing the engineering and you do your best, but you know, environment can always throw you a loop. And it, especially with entry, descent, and landing, there is no one person or one team that's smart enough to do everything by themselves. So if you actually go to slide 14, this is a picture of the Mars 2020 um, team. Uh, you can see that it's massive, and this is just actually the JPL component. We have um, team members from all over, uh, including different NASA centers like NASA Langley and NASA Ames and uh, NASA Johnson and uh, scientific contributors from not just um, US or NASA, but other universities and around the world. Uh, so it's really a team effort um, throughout the entire development and hopefully it'll all be worth it come February 18th, 2021, when we finally get Perseverance on the ground on the surface of Mars. I'd be happy to take any questions, Brandon, if, if you want. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's just, it's really exciting to hear uh, a, a little bit more about this because I think we've spent so much time talking about all of the new instruments uh, when it comes to surface operations and kind of the future of the the exploration of Mars, but not a lot of time actually talking about how these technology developments for Perseverance have opened up brand new places for us to even go. Uh, so it's really, really cool to hear about. Um, first and foremost, you know, what, what I'm wondering, you kind of mentioned not only just looking at this picture of your team, but uh, some of the hardships of getting ready for launch. Um, what was it like, you know, working remotely? I, I remember for launch, you know, my team and my friends, we were all on, uh, you know, effectively a Zoom call and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of watching and then we felt the earthquake as well, which was pretty terrifying. Uh, and that was just to enjoy, you know, the fruits of the labor. What was it like actually trying to work remotely leading up to that point? It was really interesting. You know, JPL has honed how it does operations over so many missions that we had specific protocols and ways of practicing and preparing. And we had kind of just started to get into that preparation when the pandemic hit and nobody knew how long it would last. Nobody knew if, you know, oh, we just have to make it through another week or another month. And it, we really had to figure it out as we went along. So um, how many people do you actually need in mission control? Uh, is the communication really stable of people's home internet in order to be able to rely on that to talk? Um, it's made our communication uh, much more critical. So as in, you have to really know what you're saying and be really crisp about how to communicate uh, what's going on because now you're not in a room with everybody else and you can't read the facial expressions. You can't go down the hallway and find someone to just, oh, talk about this one thing that I figured out. So w we've had to learn as we go and it's been, it's been interesting. There are definitely some perks. I've had uh, quite a few night shifts uh, for cruise operations, which had it been, um, you know, pre-COVID, I would have had to spend that night shift, you know, in the JPL mission control. But now that we're trying to do everything remotely, I was able to be in my pajamas and like in my bed with my computer on top of my lap, just uh, listening on my headphones and being able to do the, the whole um, check out that way, not just for crews, but all the way through um, during ATLO development too, because when the pandemic hit, we still hadn't finished putting the spacecraft fully together. So uh, I remember when I left 
um, from the first trip to Kennedy after doing the first round of checkouts, I was like, oh, I'll be back like two more times to check out my hardware. But that never panned out. And we had to really hone that um, process of, of doing it over the phone and, you know, waiting at the phone line gets down and being really crisp about our communications with each other to say exactly what we mean so that there's no misunderstandings at a critical point in time. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking of kind of working from a distance, you mentioned about how all of EDL is, is effectively automated. Um, so what does that look like for, for us, right? I mean, what are we, what are we doing during EDL? Uh, why, why do we have all of us together in a room? And, and what, what are you doing to, you know, ensure that we get there now that, you know, the, the ship has left? Yeah, so entry, descent, and landing itself is all automated, but the important thing is to set the vehicle up just prior to that so it has its best chance of landing. So uh, some of the things that we do is that we seed um, Perseverance with its best knowledge of where it is because that's how it knows. If it knows where it is, it can control itself as it's doing the entry descent landing. So this involves the team monitoring the uh, telemetry coming back from the deep space network to um, analyze where Perseverance is, monitoring if it's veered off course such that we have to correct its knowledge of itself. Um, and then also if there's anything that happens in that last you know, week or days or you know, even hours before landing, um, up until you know just an hour or so before landing, we still have the opportunity to send commands. So there are things that the ground can do um, to fix problems quickly to give Perseverance its best chance at landing safely. So that's really what we're doing in mission control. We're making sure that Perseverance stays on course. We're making sure that it has the best knowledge of where it is. And we're just monitoring to make sure nothing unexpected happens that would um, prevent it from executing entry, descent, and landing safely all the way up until the point where we have to take our hands off the wheel. Yeah, stressful, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, someone was asking online, and you you showed a kind of a slide showing the uh, uh, the kind of planned trajectory from launch and, and arrival on Mars. Um, and you mentioned that this kind of you know effectively Mars catches up. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that flight path? Why that way? Why not, for example, when the two planets are closest to each other? So the selection of the trajectory and the launch window is really based on um, optimizing the path from Earth to Mars. And the reason we do that is because it it takes fuel to uh, launch the vehicle into orbit. It takes fuel in terms of uh, trajectory correction maneuvers to get from Earth to Mars. And all of that is, uh, you know, it's weight. So in order to, to launch all that, you have to get it off the surface of the Earth, and you have to have a launch vehicle that's capable of getting all of that weight off the surface of the Earth. So the, the selection of the trajectory kind of goes hand in hand with when we want to launch, how long it'll take to get there, what's the mass of our rover, um, what's the mass of the whole system, how much can the launch vehicle actually um, put up into space, and how fast can it put up that amount of mass into space, trying to optimize all those variables together to get it such that it will go where it needs to go. Changing those variables a little bit, um, delaying that launch, you know, that just means we probably won't have enough fuel for all conditions that we want to make sure that we're robust to. So we kind of take all those variables into consideration to pick uh, a launch window a mass, uh, arrival date, things like that. Got it, got it, yeah. Much much more complicated than, than I, I certainly understand. Yeah. Um, what a, you know, kind of talking about some of, again, these, these big new uh, developments other than how uh, EDL is going to take place is of course, things like the Mars helicopter. I know a lot of people are really excited about that. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, a parachute wouldn't work because of the fact that, you know, that there's not enough atmosphere to slow down the rover with a parachute. And that's why we have something like the, the sky crane technique. But now we have a helicopter launching. So can you comment, how is it that a helicopter is able to work on Mars? And, and what's the point? What, what are we hoping to discover with that? 
so it's not that a parachute doesn't work. It's that a parachute, um, once it opens, depending on how big is it, it is, eventually gets to a terminal velocity. So it doesn't slow us down enough to get to the very soft landing that that we want. So we couple it with the the propulsive descent where we use engines just to slow ourselves down. And that's because Mars's atmosphere is just much thinner than Earth's atmosphere. So the amount that you would slow down on Mars, there's just not enough um, air that's pushing back against you to slow down. So the Ingenuity helicopter will, will be a really big step forward because it's actually the first time we will have that sort of powered flight on Mars. And they did a lot of technology development in order to get it to work. So the the Ingenuity uh, helicopter itself is a super lightweight, small package. It has about, I think, one meter um, blades, like a helicopter that are actually super wide that they've tested to act to be able to actually generate enough lift to lift the small uh, ingenuity off of the surface of Mars. You know, we never know what this technology can lead to. Back when we did Sojourner um, in 97, nobody thought we could do rovers on Mars and Sojourner was a tiny little package and look how far we've come since there. You know, we're, this is our, fifth rover that we're landing on Mars since there, and they've just gotten bigger and better and way more capable. So it'll be really exciting to see Ingenuity work and just seeing what other areas of exploration it'll actually open up. Um, kind of in a similar vein, whether for Ingenuity or, or for from the EDL perspective, um, kind of just a, a good student question here, looking at kind of that Martian background. Does, does Mars have weather like do you have to worry about perhaps like a daily or seasonal kind of variability as you're as you're planning for a safe landing that's a great question we do worry about weather not just on the surface of mars but actually solar weather too so uh, during cruise we we monitor for uh, solar flares and solar weathers because that can have uh, impact on our electronics as we're in space and then we do actually monitor the atmosphere of uh, Mars and the Mars weather reports almost daily during those last couple of weeks as we're heading into Mars. Mars ha can have uh, dust storms that that build up that could um, make it a little tricky for us to land in. So we want to be able to know those sorts of things as we're coming in um, into entry, descent, and, uh, and landing. Perseverance, though, is um, actually landing in a very nice season on Mars compared to, to other missions. So it's supposed to be really calm and, and quiet for us. So we're looking forward to that. Um, there's, there's another really, really smart student question here that uh, looking not just at um, the weather, but you mentioned, you know, looking at the software that's going to be able to tell that you don't land on a rock, that's, you know, at least looking at a, a safe landing place. You mentioned that in kind of a more uh, topography point of view. Um, are you able to also tell, you know, for example, that it's not, you know, uh, uh, like a texture problem, right? Like, would you sink or will you get stuck? Um, are you able to tell that from the, uh, the, the landing software as well? So the process of making that safe targets map was actually um, performed here on the ground. And the primary source of data that it used was from the high-rise imager on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So using the high-rise imager, um, we were able to piece together really um, high resolution images of the Jezero landing site. And uh, we had a team of people at JPL, at USGS, geologists, scientists, engineers, all pour over those images to identify what they thought were hazards. And hazards is defined fairly broadly. So there are areas where they would see, you know, ripples in, in the texture of that image that they weren't sure whether it was sand or quicksand or, or structure. Um, so they would mark those out of, mm, I'm not sure about this area. It's possibly inescapable. So just like, let's mark it as a, you know, as probably don't want to go here. And um, we went through that process with a bunch of different types of hazards. So things that are possibly inescapable, um, like sand pits or things like that, rocks, slopes. Um, we even had a whole plethora of 
you know, judging sizes of rocks to determine, you know, what uh, what level was dangerous? If there were big rocks here, does that mean there were smaller rocks here? Um, channels, uh, things like that. So we kind of got together and over the course of years, poured over these maps to find these hazards, to mark it out um, using all the assets that we have. Even some of the uh, images from Curiosity as it drove around uh, helped inform that, that decision because we were able to see Curiosity driving of what it felt like for Curiosity to drive through certain regions and then look at those same regions from high rise and say, oh, Curiosity drove around here. That's what this area looks like. So if we look at, see that same thing over here at Jezero, then maybe it has the same texture um, and kind of follow that pattern to create this map of the Jezero landing site where we've gone through with a fine tooth comb to try to give our best understanding of the levels of safety in, uh, in this landing site. Yeah, the, the high-rise images are some of my favorite uh, to look at on the on the Mars website or their Instagram, I, I think is just some really, really beautiful images. And the level of detail is just incredible uh, to be able to, to see from that height. I will um, say that um, Perseverance actually has the best maps we've ever made of Mars because we since we have to find an actual spot to land in, now it's really important that you know, a rock that we identify, like we know exactly where it is. It's not enough to say, oh, there are some rocks here. You actually have to know where this rock is and that rock is. So working with the USGS um, and JPL and putting together all these images from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, they're the best, most accurate maps that we've ever created of a Mars landing site. Very cool, very cool. Uh, an important question that, that always comes up, um, is you mentioned joysticking earlier. And obviously there is a, a, a distance as you as you detailed in between Earth and Mars and we're limited on the speed of light. Um, can you just briefly describe what does driving the rover look like? What what is what does locomotion for the rover and operations look like? So on the surface of Mars, once uh, perseverance is on the ground, there is a, a few different options that we have of how to drive the rover. Um, there's one option which is sort of like joysticking where you can actually tell the rover to follow a specific path in front of it. This, this technique is usually used when uh, it's for short drives and it's when you have imagery of the entire area around Perseverance. So you, the, the planners on the ground can really say, okay, I'm gonna follow this path right through all of these rocks. Um, so that's one option of the, the closest to joysticking that we can have. The other side of it is fully autonomous. Perseverance, actually, we've upgraded the autonomous driving software on Perseverance compared to Curiosity. So Perseverance can actually drive autonomously uh, over three times faster than Curiosity could. Now their, their pedal to the metal speed of how fast they can physically go is the same. It's all about how fast you can drive autonomously. And the advantage that Perseverance has is that it actually has a second brain. So the same brain that does train relative navigation also helps it with the autonomous driving once we're on the surface because it allows us to think while we drive. So as we take images on the surface of where to drive, Perseverance can actually think of where to go next before it's finished driving the first step. This is what people do by nature, right? You see something, you're starting to take another step, and then by the time you finish that step, you you know where you're going to put the other foot that's coming down. Curiosity couldn't do that. It had to take a picture, stop, think, 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 then say, okay, I'm going to drive forward by this amount, drive, stop, take another picture, think, think, think. So as you can imagine, that kind of slows you down when you're trying to drive autonomously. So really excited to see uh, Perseverance be able to explore more because it has this faster autonomous driving capability. Awesome. Yeah, super helpful to hear. Um, I, I just have kind of one one last question for you. I think it's it's really important that we always ask this question. Uh, so it comes up pretty often. I think a lot of people uh, who who might be tuning in, especially students at home, might wonder what it takes to get to JPL. And and to hear your presentation, uh, you know, it's so it's so unique to hear again someone so specifically aligned to one part of many parts of this huge project, just like when we saw the, the full team photo. Um, 
I'm sure these are not all people with your same job title and skill set, right? Uh, so this is a huge undertaking, and, and I'm always curious, you know, what what type of scientists and engineers do you work with, and how did you get to where you are here at NASA, so that we can kind of model our careers off of that? What tips do you have so we can kind of follow in your in your path? Well, I guess the first I would say that there's no one path to to get to JPL or to to get to NASA, and it really comes down to following your passion. There's all sorts of people at JPL and NASA and on 2020, and, and no one person does the same thing. What makes JPL great is that we're able to work together as a team because everyone brings different strengths, different capability, and works on different pieces of uh, the bigger puzzle. But what we all have in common is that we're all super excited by JPL's mission to dare mighty things and to explore space. And that enthusiasm and passion really motivates and uh, connects all the people to doing their best and and uh, supporting the team. And following that passion, I would say, is the, the best way to um, create your own path of where you want to go. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. It's it's really been one of the delights at JPL is to see the the diversity of careers and just how they all work together. Um, I think uh, uh, my manager always makes fun of there being too many chemists around, uh, whereas I was shocked to see there were so many like geologists and the importance of geology at JPL. And you talked about the USGS and uh, that collaboration. I, I think it's just it's so wild to think how many different skills it takes to to really come together. Yep. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. I hope uh, uh, everyone at home enjoy hearing a little bit about how EDL is going to, to take place. Now we've, we've laid the groundwork uh, for the uh, uh, student challenge on your mission to Mars. And uh, hopefully you guys can begin taking a look at what it means to plan your mission, get ready for the excitement of uh, launching just as we have and catch up, catch up to us as you prepare for uh, your entry, descent, and landing in your classrooms and at home, and uh, you know, kind of take place in, in uh, some of the the excitement with us. So I'll uh, thank you so much for joining us, um, and uh, I just want to share a few last slides really quick with you to kind of recap some of the opportunities in education. Um, so on my slide uh, ten, um, if you are a teacher and you're interested in in kind of exploring more about this. You'll see this website here developed by the great team in the uh, JPL education department. And this is lessons that have been created, not just for Mars, but for, for all aspects of NASA research. Um, everything is NGSS aligned. You can filter by grade level. So you can see you know, something that really pertains exactly to uh, your, uh, your students' needs. Um, on slide 11, you'll see that if you are teaching at home or you're a teacher using distance learning, uh, there's this learn section, which is written a little bit more for kind of uh, student driven activities. So this is the student is exploring instead of the teacher is delivering. And uh, this is a really great opportunity for you at home to just kind of tinker around with some of uh, uh, NASA science. On slide uh, 12, you'll see that this is, uh, you know, put together in these really uh, great collections. You can find some of these on the learning space page. So if you're looking for kind of a larger overview about what it is that uh, is being done in, in one space all at once, here's a chance for you to see not just lessons, but articles, videos, other multimedia, uh, uh, just a really great place to kind of dive deeper on, on topics like uh, how we land on Mars. And I'll close with uh, slide 13, letting you guys know that, again, this is just a small sample. I really encourage you to uh, uh, tinker around with our website. There's so much cool stuff. Uh, we're always putting out new content, um, whether it's sessions like these, whether it's our, our teacher resources, tons, tons for you guys to see. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited for uh, 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 what you guys put together. So please send us your student work, send us your student work samples. Um, and we're really uh, uh, pumped to be part of the process with you. Thanks so much for joining. Hi everyone, I'm Emily. NASA is landing the next rover on Mars in February, and they want kids from all over the world to join in the excitement. 
They're inviting educators and families to lead students in designing and building their own mission to Mars. Then, land with Perseverance on February 18th. It's the Mission to Mars Student Challenge. With five weeks of activities, professional development for teachers, and opportunities to chat with engineers and scientists, NASA's Mission to Mars Student Challenge has everything you need to bring students from brainstorming to liftoff all the way to Mars. Register your students today to join NASA as they prepare to touch down on Mars, and I'll see you on landing day. Touchdown confirmed, we're safe on Mars. It's really important that we send a rover that's clean and we make sure that it doesn't contaminate Mars. My name is Mujige Stricker and I protect Mars from Earth bacteria. The next Mars rover is slated to go to Mars, collect samples so that eventually we can bring those samples back to Earth and determine for the very first time, did life exist on Mars? There's nothing that we can build that's sterile. So we take swabs and wipes of the spacecraft as it's being built. It gets put in an oven, it gets put in various chambers and clean rooms so that we can maintain that level of cleanliness. If we do find something on Mars, we have to make sure it's something that actually came from Mars and not something that hitched a ride. This is the place where the magic happens. Oh, it's definitely cool. In this lab, we look specifically at spores. So spores are those hardy microorganisms that can actually survive if it made it on the spacecraft the journey through space, through the vacuum. It's very humbling to be a part of this big project because there are hundreds of people that have to come together and build a spacecraft. There is no one person that can say, I did this, I made this happen. It's always a we. I owe it all to Carl Sagan and watching the cosmos. I remember being a little kid, going to the public library and renting that VHS. And from that moment, the light bulb turned on. It actually was the start of my passion of science communication. We are citizens of our universe. We have to be good ambassadors when we are exploring other planets, other moons. And so it's the right thing to do. One way or another, you're gonna be on the ground in seven minutes. We want it to be there safely. I'm Al Chen, and I lead the landing team for Mars 2020. Entry, descent, landing is all about getting the vehicle from the top of the atmosphere down to the bottom safely. You know, we hit the atmosphere going, you know, 12, 13,000 miles per hour. Uh, we have to deploy a supersonic parachute. I mean, that's all before we get down into power play. See, we have a new system that'll take over at this point. It'll start taking images of the ground. That'll let us figure out where we are in latitude and longitude. Uh, Jezero Crater, the site we're going to with Mars 2020, was actually rejected for curiosity because the site was considered too unsafe and really the train was way too rough. But now that we have the ability to land at these places that we never really could go to before. The Jezero Crater site, if you look at it from space, is pretty obviously a delta. We think that Mars was habitable about four billion years ago. So the question is not just where was that life, but also where could it be preserved for four more billion years for us to find it later. I worked on Curiosity for 10 years, so this is a very familiar feeling. I think I was too young the first time to really realize what was at stake. Seeing G's on the order of uh, 11, 12 or we are in hard flight. I've been on the other side of this too. My wife was front and center on InSight. This is actually the same seat that my wife was sitting in for the InSight landing. The same seat that I was in actually uh, back in 2012 uh, for the Curiosity landing as well. Coming up on entry. A lot of history for us in this room. I'm shouting for proceed. We might be uniquely positioned as two folks who are married to each other to know what it's like to land things on Mars. <laughs>